we would rather see them than, than ourselves. Oh, so you guys are spotlighted. So you want, but in Q and A, we could bring them. Okay. Up. Okay. That's fine. All right. Great. Well, um, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming out on a raw, damp March evening. Uh, it's wonderful to see you. And uh, welcome also to those who are joining us by Zoom. We can't exactly see you guys, so um, welcome anyway. Um, for those of you who are here in person, we invite you to stay for a reception after our discussion, or you're welcome to get up and get some of this wonderful food mm -hmm. that's been provided. Um, and Perul will also be selling and signing books after the conversation, so please do stay for that. And for those of you on Zoom, if you haven't already bought the book, I encourage you to do so as it's a great read. And you can purchase the book on Amazon uh, or anywhere, presumably, where books are sold. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know. Any online retailer or bookstore. Great. Yeah. Great. So before we begin, I would like to thank the Columbia Alumni Association for hosting our conversation this evening and Stanley Clark in particular, who's been instrumental in helping organize the event. Stanley, why don't you come in front of the camera and give us yeah. a... Give us, give everybody, give Stanley a, a, a thank you, Stanley. We could do nothing without Stanley, so um, wonderful. Um, so welcome, Perul. It's an honor and a delight to have you here with us. Thank you. It's great to be back at Columbia at the Alumni Center um, coming up from Atlanta. And I want to thank everyone on Zoom for joining us and for people here to being here and also to thank the Columbia Alumni Center and the Fiction Foundry that I used to be a member. Of. Yeah, so, yeah, it's so exciting when we have a member who, you know, who goes on to 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 um, get their book published. Congratulations on publishing Inside the Mirror. It's a wonderful book by the University of Nebraska Press and for winning the AWP Prize for Fiction. That's, you know, that's really very, very exciting. Yeah, thanks. Well, it's been a long journey, but it was very it was very exciting when it happened. Well, we'll talk more about that. We'll, um, before we get to our conversation, um, I will just give a brief um, introduction to the book for those of you who haven't read it. Um, so Inside the Mirror is set in 1950s Bombay um, in India. It centers on twin sisters, Kamlesh and Jaya Malhotra. Jaya dreams of becoming a painter and Kamlesh a dancer of the classical Bharatna Natyam dance tradition. Their father is a supporter of women's education, but nevertheless assumes the right to choose his daughter's professions. For Jaya, a doctor, and for Kamlesh, a teacher. Jaya and Kamlesh's personal stories take place at a pivotal time in India's history, when the country was remaking its own identity in the devastating aftermath of colonial rule. At this time, shortly after 1947, the year of India's independence, a new dynamic art movement was taking shape. A group of visionary painters proclaimed a new artistic vision for India, rejecting the British academic training painting that they had been um, trained in for a fresh visual language that they believed would invigorate a culture England had stifled for two centuries. It was a time of rebirth and also unrest with protests echoing the divisions of partition. So for those who are not familiar with India's history, Perul, what, what is partition? So partition informs this novel. This novel is set in the 1950s after Indian independence and partition. But the partition of India was, I think you could compare it to the Holocaust for India. And it happened literally almost at the same time, but it's not really known in the West because it happened in India. And um, from what I've read also, there was no international assistance to India at this time because the Western powers were occupied or busy with dealing with a different partition, which was the partition of Palestine in 1948. So what happened in 1947 in India was that partition, you could say, is a culmination of the British policy of divide and rule. They had ruled over India for over two centuries. And one of the ways they really maintained power was to divide Hindus and Muslims. They did that in many ways. Uh, for instance, they partitioned the um, province of Bengal in the early 1900s, trying to create a Muslim majority in one part of the province and a Hindu majority in the other. So when they were leaving India in 1947, 
they had fomented so much animosity between Hindus and Muslims between by all of these things that they had done, partitioning Bengal, creating separate electorates of Muslims should vote for Muslim candidates, Hindus should vote for Hindus when India got a little bit of what they called self-rule in, in state legislatures. And so uh, in 1947, partition was basically driven by one man who was uh, called Muhammad Ali Jinnah. He was the, became the first head of state of Pakistan. He had the Muslim League and he saw that he could get the British behind him in creating his own country so that he could be head of state. I think he really wanted the power and he was afraid he wouldn't get it with Nehru uh, in India. And he thought it's a Hindu majority nation and they won't put me as the prime minister. And so he drove this bus of partition and started to say, by all means necessary, we'll have a divided India or we'll have a destroyed India. And the Muslim League became extremely violent. And then you had the Hindu kind of counter movement where you had Hindu nationalists rising up to counter this movement. In the end, what happened in 1947, literally exactly as the time the British left, they divided India, they cut off the Eastern section and the Western section, and that became West Pakistan and East Pakistan, and you have India in the middle. And Jinnah got exactly what he wanted. He got to be the head of state. He only lived for a year, then he died. Um, and Pakistan was really, in my view, born out of all of this violence. And, um, and so that partitioning of the country resulted in enormous destruction. You had Hindu and Muslim groups fighting each other. A lot of it, they're doing research now, was organized. There were organized groups. It wasn't just mass violent. It was mass, but it was still pretty organized. And so you had about, just on the Western side, They've done new research at Harvard. You had two or three million people killed and 18 to 20 million people became refugees because oh, what happened was when you say the Western part of India is now Pakistan, all the Hindus left. Then there was retaliation in the part that was India where the Hindus there were then massacring Muslims. So the Muslims were moving to Pakistan and a later effect happened in the East. So there were at least several million people killed and in a very short period of time, oh my goodness. like under a year. And all of these uh, refugees who were completely displaced, like my father's family, they lost everything. They had no home, no bank account, no money, nothing. You just were running for your life. I mean, it is an incredible story and amazing. I don't know. I'm just curious. I can't, we can't see our Zoom people, but you guys, were you guys familiar with this history? I mean, it's not something you were, so you guys were much more so, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think I, like, it's, it's interesting to hear you talk about it from sort of like, from an and insider. Story. Talk as loud as you can, just so our Zoom people can hear you. Yeah, no, I, I like heard about it also read about it, but like, it's interesting to hear you talk about it from like an insider's point of view mm -hmm. and have it like affected, you know, your family affected. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's no, that's, I mean, it's uh, an incredible, and, and what's interesting, um, yeah. So it's interesting the particular lens you chose to tell, it, um, your story at this time, what, um, what, um, why did you choose to have your story take place at this time? Yeah, so my story, as I say, takes place in the 50s after this major catastrophe yeah. has occurred. It, it opens in 1953, so it's about six years after the catastrophe. The impact of partition lasted many, many decades, not to mention the impact of colonial rule, which completely impoverished India. And so I chose the 50s. Initially, I thought I didn't want to deal with partition because mm -hmm. it was a very messy, complicated time where it wasn't normal, right? There was no normal society. People were running for their lives. No one anticipated it. Mm -hmm. I don't even think Jinnah anticipated this much violence. Mm -hmm. Even the politicians, you know, the leaders of business, everyone was displaced. And, um, and so it wasn't a time where you can write something where that does anything except deal with the calamity. And I wanted to see the aftermath. And how do people, how do you build up your life 
after it's been destroyed. Yeah, that's a very interesting perspective. And it gave you some opportunities also to, as you said, said deal with something, you know, beyond that. Yeah. You know, sort of overwhelming. It sounds like an right. overwhelming it would, topic. It would have been overwhelming for the fiction, and the fiction could only be about the sort of the mechanics of how do you yeah. save yourself? What do you do? Yeah. And the stories that I heard from my father when I was growing up, um, you know, he had lots of stories of partition, not only about his family, but about other families. And later I realized the reason he knew so many other stories was because his, I mean, his family, his father was a, was a manager of an insurance company, had his own insurance business. He was well to do, but they fled and they um, were in Delhi and they, the only uh, accommodation they could get was in a in a Muslim college where everyone had abandoned that college and then in the dormitory the whole family lived in a single room and then his father managed to get an apartment like almost eight or nine months later and in that small apartment in Old Delhi so many of their relatives who were even worse off than them who had been professionals you know in western Punjab which became Pakistan they came and took shelter with them so this impact lasted for a long time. His clerk, my grandfather's clerk and his family of seven or eight people lived in his kitchen. There was a kitchen in the courtyard mm -hmm. and they lived there for seven or eight years. So, you know, it lasted into the fifties. Well, that's, that is, it's fascinating to hear the history was sort of the backdrop of this particular story where, you know, there, there's, there are elements of that. It certainly infiltrates the environment, the atmosphere, but you don't sort of you, you you touch on it, you allude to it, but it's not it's not the primary concern right. of this novel, um, which is a lot which which is a lot about actually the art movement. You know, as mm -hmm. both these two girls and 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 this burgeoning arts movement, um, and you know you you do a wonderful job weaving together the lives of the characters, their hopes, dreams, and struggles within this vibrant and devastating historical context. Um, you've written that in your research, you discovered that there were very few, if any, women involved in India's early modernist movement. And yet you convincingly bring not only Jaya to life, but uh, Sringara, who is a woman painter and one of Jaya's early mentors. What was your creative process around this decision to, for, first of all, I guess it's a two part question. One is to decide to move away from the direct politics into this, you know, the, this virgin mm -hmm. art movement, and then to make a wonderful fictional choice of actually creating these female characters that if I did not know from reading that, that there really weren't females represented in the actual historical <laughs> movement, I, I, I was surprised because you do, they're so convincing. Oh, so can thanks. you talk a little about that? Yeah, so I think the reason that I settled on this thing of young women who want to become artists was just very personal because when I started this novel many years ago, I was not much older than the characters. They are 19 when the novel opens. I was in my early 20s when I started the novel. And so my own personal struggle was like, I wanted to be a novelist. I wanted to be a writer. How do I do it? Can I do it? And I think just naturally I gravitated towards writing about young women who also wanted to be artists, but I didn't want to write about a writer. I knew that much. I wanted to, and I had dabbled in painting. I had dabbled in some Indian dance while I was at Wesleyan and I really loved painting. And I also just love visual art in general, besides me painting, you know, I just have a great affection for, for any kind of visual art. And so that interested me to write about a young woman who would want to be a painter and another one who would want to be a dancer. And I wanted them to do it. At that time, I had spent already spent a year in Bombay as a journalist. I had met a man who told me about the modern art movement in India, how it was born in 1947 uh, by this group of male artists who declared a kind of independence of their own because they said, we don't wanna be part of British academic painting that's been kind of forced down our throats in these big art academies. And we don't also wanna have be bound to Indian traditional painting, folk painting, miniature painting. We wanna embrace, but there's a sense of like, it's a new life, a new world. We want to embrace Picasso, modernism, be part of this whole new modern movement that's global. 
And even though they had never seen any of this art in real life, they had only seen pictures and, you know, they were so far away from Europe. And so I knew this was a group of male artists. I think I had asked that man who I, it was a gallerist who told me that, you know, in 1947, this group formed what the characters, personalities of the artists were, but he said there were no women. And then I was like, well, I'm going to imagine, you <laughs> yeah. know, like anyway, to be an artist, you have to go against all the odds. So <laughs> why not um, create a woman artist? And Bharatanatyam dance, definitely there were, you know, women. It was, sure. it's, on, it's only basically a woman's dance. Um, but later <laughs> I found out actually there were some women artists. You know? Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah, there was actually one. This, I am fictionalizing the progressive artist group. I call it the group 47 in my novel. Um, but there was a woman who had exhibited, I just found that out a few years ago. People have done research into that and they they discovered there was a woman who exhibited with the progressives just in one of their exhibitions. And then she left to become a costume designer in the movies because mm. the movie industry is big in Bombay. Mm. And then she actually won an Academy Award for Gandhi. She, oh, she designed wonderful. all the costumes for the film Gandhi. That would be an interesting book to <laughs> yeah. story to write as well. Yeah. So, um, where did you? So you did you? You had all this in, knowledge about the history, and 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 then you knew about the art movement, this new movement, and then you kind of had this idea to imagine mm -hmm. these these um, to bring some women into it, and. What was your, as a journalist, what were some of the journalistic techniques and how did that meld with the fiction? Like, how did you, how did you, how did those two work together? In yeah, terms of your so process? I've always worked as a journalist alongside yeah. writing fiction. Like when I was at college, my creative, um, my thesis was a creative writing thesis. I wrote short stories, but I've always worked on every like college newspaper. And then I went to Bombay Magazine, worked there. So the main thing as a journalist is you interview people to get your story. That's how I've always done it. And especially in like, quote unquote, old days, that's, you know, you went out to the scene, you looked around, you investigated the actual place where whatever was taking place, and then you talked to people. And um, so that's how I approached the story. I didn't actually know. I mean, I had a rough idea, of course, of the history and things, but there was a lot I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And so being in the US, I was very far away from India because I had come back from my year in Bombay and I was doing an MFA at Columbia. Then I started working at a travel magazine. So I would just try to find people. I found an mm. artist in New York. His name is Mohan Samant. And he had been part of that progressive artist group. And he had left India, I think, in the 50s. A lot of them disbanded. That group was very short lived. They disbanded within a few years and they wanted to make their careers in Europe. Hmm. And um, unfortunately, I think a lot of them were very disappointed because they were neither appreciated in India, hmm. nor could they really make a name of themselves in the West. And so Mohan Samanth had come to New York. I don't know how I found out about him because this is all before internet. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I did contact him. I went to his apartment in, I think it was in the 30s. And I sat with him for like six or seven hours. And he told me a lot about how, the, you know, those group of artists work together, the kind of meetings they would have to mm. critique each other's mm. work, what the role of some European, uh, some German Jewish um, men who had been involved in one way or the other with the art scene in Germany, whether as collectors or critics, when they were fleeing the Nazis, some landed in Bombay. Oh, wow. And so... Oh then they kind of became the prophets of Western art in Bombay. So two or three of them were very prominent. One was a art critic for the Times of India newspaper. So he was telling me how that whole ecosystem worked yeah. in the 50s. And so similarly, you know, Jay is a medical student. So I interviewed Indian doctors here. That's, of course, more plentiful than yeah. artists who had studied in Bombay in the 50s at that medical okay. college where she is. And People who are here actually remember the past much better than people who are in India who have seen so much change. 
Oh, that's interesting. So it almost, yeah, because in a way it would be a snapshot that would get frozen instead, yes. of, instead of revised over the years. Yeah. And did you go back to India? Like, for example, the settings are very vivid. Was that from your own um, your time memory of your time in India? Or did you go back in the, in the, in, in, from, you know, mm -hmm. in the intervening years at all? Oh, yeah. I did make a couple of trips back okay. for sure. I didn't, make, I didn't go back as often as I should have, or I should have stayed a very long time in just, you know, a few months and done all my research so my research was more sporadic mm -hmm. but I did go back and what I also started to see was like the medical college that I had seen in the late 80s let's say where I had access to go into the cadaver hall and even witness surgeries and stuff like that because I had a friend who was a doctor and got me access to all this um what I saw back then versus I even went I think as late as like sometime in the 2000s, it had all changed. The, the mm. environment of the medical college yeah, I can imagine, yeah. Yeah, so I had seen it, I think, a lot closer to what it was like in the 50s because India had been poor for so long and when a country is poor, it doesn't change. Uh, then when money comes in, it starts to change more and it started to change a lot of the tech. Yeah, boy, I see there's the just patients. a lot you had to assimilate between the people you spoke to, the you know, historic history, and then bring it all together into something else, into something living and cohesive is you know quite a feat. Um, there are actually a variety of fascinating plot threads that weave through the story, including the twins' volunteer work in a slum colony near their father's factory. Um, and you know, well, before you, you're going to read a passage on that, but sort of just, to, but I'm curious. As I'm listening to you, this is not part of the prepared um, questions because I'm also uh -huh. hearing what sure. you're saying. And, you know, did you, you know, there's, there's, we as writers know that you have to create your world. And, you know, even just describing someone's kitchen, you know, from my knowledge, they're very small scope. And, you know, I have a Pinterest board for someone's kitchen. You have so many settings and so many characters. Like, how did you, you know, for example, the factory, what made you decide that the father had that kind of factory? And what made you decide that, that, that there would be a slum colony in that place? What, how, did that, how did those decisions come about? Yeah, so the thing with there is a slum colony, even though it's a story about two young women who want to be artists, I wanted to bring in the larger society. Mm -hmm. And that comes in, at least in part, through this slum colony that they become involved in and their grandmother who lives with them. She's a former freedom fighter but she's been kind of very um, damaged by all the tragedies she's seen, especially around partition. And so all three of them, the two young daughter, the two granddaughters and the grandmother get very involved in this slum colony. And there was an actual slum colony that I had reported on ah, okay. when I was at Bombay magazine, this slum colony is in a very different setting. It's behind well behind their father's glass factory, which mm -hmm. is, way outside Bombay in an industrial area called Dana. But the one I saw was in the middle of Bombay. It was in sandwiched in between Navy and Army um, installations. and But similarly, it was kind of orphaned and abandoned. They didn't have water. They didn't have power. Okay. A politician took me there to tell me all the great stuff he was going to do mm. for them. And um, the plight of the people there really, really touched me. And, and they had just a small clinic and they were just, you know, I talked to them like that's what the journalist does. You yes. know, you talk to the people and they were telling me that, you know, we don't have anything. I don't think we'll ever get it. This man, the politician <laughs> comes here. He's telling us he's going to get us this, that, and the other thing. And they said, they basically didn't believe, you know, that was all really going to happen. It was like, we'll see it. When, we'll believe it when we see it kind of thing. Whereas he had printed up brochure saying this is what their lives used mm. to be like now their water is at their doorstep but well that's it? it's interesting to hear again the story of what you experienced and then to read how it transposed into a very cinematic um mm -hmm. you know dramatic um thread and maybe you could read a little sure. bit of that yeah so this chapter that i'm going to read from is early in the book and it's about some of the family members visiting this area where the where the father's factory is and even though he's not really the owner he's the manager of the factory and 
I think all you need to know is Jaya and Kamlesh are the twin sisters. Deepi is a cousin who lives with them. He's been displaced by partition. He's a young man in his 20s. He's studying to be a chartered accountant. So he's with them. Their grandmother is Bebeji. And there's a reference here to a Lalaji. Lalaji was their grandfather, Bebeji's husband, who died five years previously. And um, in the chapter preceding this, they had just commemorated Lalaji's fifth death anniversary. And so that has kind of triggered another breakdown in their grandmother, but now they're visiting the factory or outside the factory. Um, clouds descended on the open land behind the factory, trapping odors of dung and mud as they walked through the thick, humid air. Jay and Kamlesh brushed against each other without noticing, their eyes cast down to the wet field that streaked their feet with ochre red clay like henna. Jaya Kamlesh, come on, you girls, Deepi shouted from a distance, waving them forward with a baton of rolled drawings in his hand. Jaya waved back, urging her sister to hurry. Babyji was with Deepi, a stout figure in pure white, a worker from the factory clinging to her side. He'd been pleading with her to bless his newborn son. His hut lay somewhere out here behind the factory, he said, not more than a 20-minute walk. Manu ran in great circles around the group as if he were playing in a sporting match, all of them dwarfed by the fractured hills thrown up against the dingy sky. The atmosphere at home had been tense since Lalaji's death anniversary a week back. Mummy had urged them to leave the flat and see the glass tanks in operation, which had so impressed her, and everyone had been eager for an outing. Only Babiji had protested saying an hour's drive to Tana was too long, but Jaya and Kamlesh said they wouldn't go without her. They had come in the scorching heat of afternoon, unfortunately, since Jaya had a half day of classes on Saturdays. Figures materialized in the empty landscape, spectral men crossing through the tall grass, goats scattered around a stand of palm trees, a faraway herd of buffalo tended by a shirtless boy, striking the ground with a tall stick. Jaya loved the great wilderness of Thana, 30 miles north of the city. Somewhere in the middle of this lush land, tilting up to the monsoon green hills, lay the site of Indus glass, in glass Works, proposed workers' housing colony. A pamphlet she'd seen promoting the new industrial belt illustrated a thriving manufacturing city of the future, sleek chimneys billowing smoke into the air. At present, perhaps a dozen factories had gone up. Table fans, ball bearings, kerosene stoves, tractor parts. Deepi could recite the products made by the units neighboring Indus Glass Works Private Limited, which occupied the largest industrial compound in Thana after the Kilachan's automobile plant. At each phase of its development, they were taken to visit the factory and offer their impressions. It was virtually a family business, all of them calling it our factory, though their father could afford to invest only a small amount, having been a government, government servant most of his life. Thippy called out again. Jaya turned impatiently to Kamlish. Look where they've reached. Let's hurry up. She hated being left behind, being the slow one. She bent down to roll up the stiff, cuffs of her salwar, shaking off her slippers. Kamlesh stopped to do the same, letting out a whimper when her dainty clutch purse fell in the muck. Carrying her muddy chuppels, Jaya sprinted across the pebble-strewn slush, spraying wet mud onto her kurta. Wait, don't run off like that, Kamlesh cried out. Jaya paused, looking back, giving her sister a chance to catch up. The factory compound was not far behind them, closed off by a high boundary wall, topped by jagged shards of glass. Above the serrated iron roof of the furnace shed, twin chimneys rose into the sky, one expelling a red flame and the other plumes of hot gases. A three-month trial phase of production was underway, an engineer brought over from America to train the workers. The whole enterprise filled them with pride. It would be the third largest glass factory in the country eventually employing about 400 workers. 
Jaya could faintly hear some laborers' children screaming as they jumped off large pipes stacked beside the factory's back gate. Kamlesh had stopped to talk to them earlier and asked where they lived. In those hills, the children had said, pointing to the distance. Jaya and Kamlesh had been puzzled. Those hills? So far away? Come on, let's run up, Jaya scolded her twin now, gesturing ahead to the others. She began walking quickly, still agitated by the tension at home. For two days after the ceremony for Lalaji, Bebeji had refused to eat. Only in the last few days had she started taking a chapati with some dry vegetables. She kept saying she was born in Punjab and she wanted to die there, asking daddy to buy her a train ticket to Ludhiana where her brother Lekraj lived, the eldest of five. Finally, their father had ordered her to stop talking like that. Jaya had sat at her writing table, listening, the old dread coming back to her, that sense of being trapped in the despair of the people she was bound to, the same sensation that had shaken her after partition when the family people's stories caught like hooks under her skin, forgotten only during the hours she was at school. She had been eager to come here and walk in the open for distances that weren't possible in the city, to free her mind by wandering. Lifting her gaze to the hills, she realized what she had taken to be croppings of black rock amid the flourishing greenery were probably clusters of shanties, spreading like a wild, rainy season growth, their zigzagging lines tracing the ridges' ragged stone contours. People are living up there, it looks like. Just as those children sh said, she remarked to Kamlesh. Where? On that big long hill. There are Jopris up there. She gestured to the dark blots along the front ridge. Behind it, the rocky peak of another taller hill was sheared off at a steep angle. Within the folds of the ridge were what appeared to be black holes that might be openings in the stone. I wonder if there are caves in those hills, she said to Kamlesh. It would be interesting to go up and look. Her old drawing master, Matre Saab, had explored the hills outside Bombay, searching for caves decorated with rock sculptures and the frescoes of Buddhist monks. As an art student in the 20s, he had, taken, he, he had been taken to the Ajanta Caves to create facsimiles of the ancient paintings by the light of flaming torches. For months, he and his class fellows had copied those sublime images of dancers and musicians and gods, an experience so vivid, vivid, he said he dreamt about painting in that firelight for years afterward. Going into the caves, Mathre Saab said, he had come to know himself as an image maker. Hearing his story, Jaya wanted to submerge herself into drawing something as intensively as he had to turn herself into an image maker like him. She settled on flowers after, visit, after viewing Mathre Saab's enchanting little book on flower paintings in history. Everything she drew or painted, she did to please Mathre Saab. Everything he said, she took to heart. When daddy enrolled her in interscience at 16 in the pre-medical section, Mathre Saab had dismissed her Go, go into medicine. You've made your decision. Why do you need me? He had chided her for training her talent, though he knew science wasn't her choice. At her last lesson, he had predicted she would never be an artist, and every day she fought his curse inside herself. Wonderful. Wow. I mean, hearing you read it, having read it, it's uh -huh. it's, it, it's really remarkable writing. It's so cinematic and so Thank specific you. in every single detail. You know, this factory where, you know, the one, one plume, you know, one plume of smoke, one seam, you know, the specificity of the landscape, the dropping her purse in the muck. I mean, every detail, it's like you're there. So how did you, did you just kind of go into that world and, and, and or did you have to stop and say, oh, I, I have a factory. I need to research factories at that time. Um, I guess it's a combination of yeah. both, you know, I was lucky in that when I, you know, I started this book many years ago, right in the eighties. And so at that time it was closer 
to the 1950s and 60s. And so in my library in Wilton, Connecticut, I found this book on glass factories and the whole tank tank furnace technology was new because this is to make sheet glass. And in India, you know, used to have a lot of small glass manufacturers, but not big sheet sheet glass manufacturing. So I had that book from Corning, but I had visited in India a, a tank furnace glass wow. factory. I had gone, looked inside the tanks like they do later. It's, it sounds like we all need to live our lives because you're bringing so much of your own personal experience into this, but also doing the research and a curious mind, a wide ranging <laughs> curious mind. I mean, amazing, um, really beautiful. Um, and and um, yeah, so you felt that that was an important element, as you said, because you wanted to, you, you know, allude you know make this time in history also very real and and the hardships as well as the personal story yeah and i wanted I, I think because i've been a journalist so i've always been involved in stuff that's going on in the outside world right yeah. journalism is not about you can do personality profiles as features but usually you're covering things that are happening in society mm -hmm. so maybe that's kind of natural to me and i wanted so i wanted to show the wider society i wanted to show how these girls are affected because you can't be in india especially back then now india as i say is richer mm -hmm. right it's not very rich but it's richer so you don't see the awful suffering like i saw you know on the streets of bombay when i was there in the 80s i literally saw a boy on the sidewalk he had some kind of disease he was just dying on the oh. sidewalk his body looked like it had been half eaten and so you know jaya is in a hospital you see the worst kind of suffering from people and they had all been impoverished by British rule. So those colonies, you know, represents much the suffering of Indian society mm -hmm. after the British left because they had impoverished India, mm -hmm. but they are never tied to that impoverishment. It's always like, oh, India is such a poor country. Oh, the image was beggars when we came here in the 60s. Okay. You know, India is beggars and stuff, but why were they beggars? They were the richest country in the world in the 1700s when England came but they had been left destitute. And so that destitution created a lot of suffering and you can't evade that, Yeah, especially in the 50s. So, so you, ba you, ba you bring it so vividly to life, but you also balance it. And uh, lest anyone think that this is a, always a very heavy book, it is heavy, it's serious, but we do have a love story, which <laughs> I of course enjoyed um, between Jaya and Kirti, which was, I don't want, want to give away any spoilers but that was a really fascinating and a lot of suspense around this relationship and what was going to happen and the scenes were beautifully revealed and i am curious did you have fun writing those scenes like okay so there's the research in the glass factory there's the history there's the you know the 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 you know all of the hardship and then there's a love story which part did you like writing most some people hate writing love stories so it's actually hard and i uh -huh. think that you got the you know the, the <laughs> chemistry between them very beautifully it's very subtly done you know it's not this is not pulp fiction but um but it's very you know it was it was very sensual and beautiful what did you enjoy writing that or was that hard yeah i mean i enjoyed writing it i think it wasn't i wouldn't say that was the hard part the okay. hard part is more you know like when you do have to research but not let your research yes. show too much and integrate it into the the dr dramatic action um and why was it important to have that threat because i wanted to show how jaya she's not a, a rebellious person by nature but because she wants something which is painting which is um you know, you would think, well, why would painting not be approved of by her society? Because she's expected to become a doctor. Her father has chosen that for her. But then she's also expected to have an arranged marriage and live in a conventional way within the society. And to convert with this group of male artists, you know, and then later she leaves home to live with a female mentor. All of that brings a lot of shame onto her and her family because you're never supposed to leave home unless you get married you're never supposed you nobody gets an apartment on their own and a job or anything especially in the 50s that never happened you stayed with your parents you went to college you might live away from home while you're at college you came back you were immediately married after college and then you went into your husband's home so for her to leave her parents home and then to be associated with these men would all be very um shameful but i wanted to show that 
She's a person who kind of follows her desires and by following her desires, she becomes a rebel. It's not because she wants to just rebel against her parents mm -hmm. for the heck of it. Um, and so there's this boy at medical college who she's very attracted to. And so she's again, just following what seems, she knows it's not right, but you know, she's very attracted to him. Um, but you also see how change happens. It's this pivotal moment in history that you actually bring to life for us. And you wonder, like, how did it, how does, how does a country or society go from something so traditional with such strict rules of behavior to becoming something very different? And, and, you know, you see this pivotal moment where this, you know, these two young girls ha are faced with, with these conflicting desires and, 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 and loyalties, mm -hmm. both to themselves and, and, you know, their art and their desires, but also to their family. And, um, you know, there's a real tension there, a lot of suspense. And one of the things I really liked is that you did not, um, it would be so easy to make the parents into the bad guys, mm -hmm. but the consequences were very real. I mean, the consequences to the father's job, you know, which is the livelihood of the family. This is, you know, you were, you were sympath you had a, a, um, a great breadth of sympathy, which I think wonderful uh -huh. writers always do. You know, you're not snarky to your characters. You're very, there's a lot of compassion for everyone in this, um, which I, I thought was, you know, very big hearted of you. Oh, okay. thanks. Yeah. I mean, I think the, um, this concept of shame, which isn't really known in the West, but it's very much part of Indian society. So that's why if a daughter does things that they're not supposed to like moving out of family home, just to live with a, a female artist, right? She's not moving in with a man or going off on her own or anything. And, um, you know, starts to do these things that are that no one sanctions. You bring a lot of shame on yourself. Society is extremely judgmental and it's very much like in India, everybody knows their place. It's a very stratified mm -hmm. society. There's caste, subcaste, your family, what people, your family associates with. And then if you bring shame on yourself, you bring it on your family. And then the whole family status is called into question because people will say, well, they can't control their daughter. What kind of daughters do they have? What's going on in that family? And, you know, it's in, I mean, of course, it's very extreme here, but I would, I would say that that kind of secrecy and shame is very much present in Western culture too. And we have it, you know, when, you know, if children who go, you know, who fall into difficulties or drugs or, mm. you know, especially with the um, drug epidemic in our country and, and, you know, it's very unspoken, you know, and people, I mean, I've, or people who have mental illness in their mm -hmm. family and no one speaks about it. So people think they're alone. Mm -hmm. They think it's only them. And, and, but really like you shake a tree and everyone has, has mm -hmm. what different kinds of things. So, but it's, it's more overt in a, way, in a funny way, in a way it's more, you know, it's more, um, yeah. It's... Yeah. And there it is like everyone conforms, you know, my father mm -hmm. used to say like, this, he, he was talking about the joint family because the, the traditional Hindu family was like many generations living together, several brothers having their household together in one house or whatever. And the larger society is also like that, right? It's very collective and everybody knows everyone's business mm -hmm. and it can be very nice and like you you feel you're part of a large group, mm -hmm. but it can also be very limiting. And that's what happens to these girls. And my father used to say like, I guess it's saying in India, the joint family is a fortress for the weak and a prison for the strong. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and it is, it's, it's, it, that is always sort of a balancing point because, you know, we have such a, a breakdown of that family structure mm -hmm. in America and people, people moving for their jobs all the time, you know, the digital way of people communicating, breaking down those kind of traditional um, villages and, and, and it's freedom, but it's also isolation. And I mean, there's, so it's really tricky. You know, these are tricky, tough questions. They're not so black and white in terms of the right thing. Yeah. But you, you've also written that it took you 37 years <laughs> to write this book. And of course, during that time, you had a successful career as a journalist across continents. You raised a family, you did many other things, but still it, it, it took a while to get the book out here into the world. Um, and what were some of the obstacles to completing the book either, you know, internally or, you know, just practically or, and, and also maybe we can jump to the process part, you know, getting it published. Yeah. So the 37 years was, I started it when I was doing my MFA at Columbia somewhere towards the end of my MFA. So I think I started around 86 
And I actually worked on it off and on for 25 years. Mm -hmm. Then I put it, and I had completed a second draft, which was quite long. It was about 600 pages. And, and how many words? We got to hear this. <laughs> I love this part of it. This is, <laughs> for those not... of you who write things that are too long, how Okay, many... <laughs> so for the first draft was 900 pages. Oh, okay, well, do you know what the word uh, count would be? For 900 pages? I'm not sure, okay. but over 200,000 for sure. Okay. Well over 200,000. <laughs> Keeping in mind, 85,000 <laughs> is pretty standard for a book, so yes. <laughs> yeah, then I did the second draft. It was 600 pages and 190,000 or 195,000 words. <laughs> and um, at that point... The second, so the first draft, the only person who had read it in full was my father. The second draft, unfortunately, my dad passed away in 2009. So the second draft I completed, I think, after his death. But he was the one person who was always telling me, get it done, get it done. Mm -hmm. And I felt so bad that I wasn't getting it done. Then he died, and I did, within a year, get it done to that second draft stage. Um, and I didn't know who to show it to, so I met this Indian filmmaker, Deepa Mehta, very well-known Indian filmmaker, who I was interviewing in Atlanta because she had made the film of Salman Rushdie's novel, Midnight's Children. So they had come for the premiere of Midnight's Children in Atlanta. I interviewed her and then I, told, I was like, I'm not able to get an agent or get my book published, so maybe she can make it into a movie. It was just like a pipe dream. So I asked her if she would read my novel and she said, yeah, send it to me. So I sent it to her it was a complicated sending and getting lost in the mail and all. But anyway, she ultimately got it. And then she sent me some notes back and said what she liked about it and, you know, what parts she thought I could cut. But she said, I, I'm not able to make a film out of this. <laughs> and that was year 25. And I was like, that's it. I'm, I made a whole map of how I could revise it, like 10 pages of how I would redo it. But I said, I'm not going to continue doing the same book for more than 25 years. So I put it away and I started the next novel and I did draft it. But coming back to this, what how it got published was that um, in the meantime, online, internet, everything had developed. And I saw that some friends of mine were publishing their novels through contests. And so there were actually very few contests I could apply to because of my high page count and high word <laughs> count most have a limit of a hundred thousand words but the awp price for the novel didn't have any limits. <laughs> there's no limit <laughs> so i submitted my novel and wow. then just like i guess two or three months later i heard that i won and then i had to do an intense amount of work in three or four months because uh university of nebraska press which is a great press they said, we can't look at a manuscript that's that long. So you have to cut it down to at 120,000 words mm -hmm. before our editor will even look at it. Mm -hmm. And so I had to hire a freelance editor, hire a freelance line editor, and I did cut it down to about 125,000 words. Okay, yeah. And, um, and then there was, they didn't have that much editing, but a lot of the work was done before it was submitted. Yeah, to yeah. Them. Yeah, so that's that's a, a really interesting story. Everyone comes at this a different way and arrives differently. And and um, so you got an agent then afterwards. So it was not mm -hmm. the, you know, um, yeah, which is a nice thing to know about these contests. You know, right. this is something you don't need an agent and it's, it's a nice opportunity. And um, but this is a very special book. I mean, I think that all of those years are. Um, you know, it's really distilled. It's so dense. I mean, even in the passage you read, there's mm -hmm. so much research, so much imagination, so much beautiful prose. So, yes. so you know, nothing mm -hmm. is wasted. You know, nothing is wasted as a writer. It all comes in, in there guess. somehow. Yeah. I mean, nobody wants <laughs> to be in the situation that I was in where you have written something and you don't get it published for yeah. so long. But I will say, always count on having good luck. You know, we can all say that you know, bad things happen to everyone, but there's also good luck. So, you know. Yeah. Well, what have you learned? What would you, are you going to, um, for your next book, are you going to do anything differently? Are you going to, you know, is the word count, you know, is that going to be more front of mind? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And the next book, I have drafted it fully. So now I'm going back to revise it. And I actually had started revising when I heard about the prize, then I had to drop that so that I could get this yeah. into shape very, very quickly within four or five months. And um, yes, yeah, so I think for the next book, the things that I've learned for myself are in terms of research, 
it's set in India. It's set in a very remote part of India where my dad used to work in an oil company in the jungles of Assam. And um, I have been there. I did a lot of research there, even though a very short period of time, like eight days. But whatever other things I need, I'm going to like sort of even do it more as a journalistic assignment, like get all my research done. If I have to go back to India, I might do that. Whereas this book, I just would, I didn't assert myself as much as I should have in terms of I need to find out about this, I need to do this, I need to spend four months in India. I didn't, I had a family and I felt like I can't just take off and go. So now I would, if I need, whatever much time I feel I need to spend, be more organized in terms of finding what kind of research if mm -hmm. I have to do anything, mm -hmm. you know, and just approach it very pragmatically. Yeah. Well, I also hear a lot of courage. I mean, a lot in the, in the, in this conversation in the, this evening, there were a number of times when you sort of in an offhand way say, well, I reached out to this person. I sat down for six hours with that person. And these things all take courage to reach out to yeah, asking someone who's you know in, in, in Atlanta for a premiere of a movie. Hey, would you mind reading my book? I mean, I don't know how many of you guys <laughs> would have the courage to walk up to someone and say that, <laughs> you know, I have to say one thing. I mean, I might have done it anyway. It helped that she was Indian, right? Because then I thought she would have obviously connection, but she was also some very distantly related. Oh, well, <laughs> well that like, doesn't necessarily help. You know, yeah, it doesn't it necessarily help. It's extremely distant. I think it was like my dad's first cousin was married to, I don't know, her father's brother or something like that and I was like oh no but you, 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 <laughs> that would not help me so it helped you know it, um what um mm -hmm. okay so let's go out to our to our audience and see if we have any questions and and um you know um is there anyone on zoom who is so any questions at all guys we're going to um you know open it up to any, anyone here in person to start yeah great margarita uh, the blurb for the book gave the impression the book would be equally devoted to Jaya and Kalesh, but it was more about Jaya. Was that always the intent, or did you discover you just like Jaya's story more? Oh, that's a great question. Did, uh, I don't. I can't tell if the if the Zoom people heard it. Can we assume that they did? I don't know. This. Okay. Actually, yeah. These rooms are so well. If you can, liked, you if can, you can re ask the question, Tanya, it was a little hard to hear. Okay. So so um. Yes. So Margarita, basically, yeah, Margarita, the way you said it was really good. So I don't know. Do you want to just come up here and say it into this? Yeah, the mic is right here. Just come and say it into the mic for us. Thank you. So the, the blurb gave the impression the book would be equally devoted to Jaya and Kamlesh, but it was more about Jaya. Was that always the intent or did you discover that you like Jaya's story more? It was part of the evolution of the book. I guess in some way I must have known that Jaya's story would be more prominent because she's a painter. I had more experience or even more interest might maybe in, in painting and visual art and her personality is a bit more forceful and uh, than her sisters. Initially, it was a novel actually with the grandmother and the two sisters. They all had chapters devoted. And mm -hmm. then I took the grandmother out because some editor along the way said, you know, the grandmother seems extraneous to have the chapters from her point of view. Um, and then I it just became about the twin sisters. But I suppose somewhere in my mind, yes, Jaya is the more dominant twin. And so um, the story is probably much more about her. But I think her twin was, also gets... Yeah, it's pretty well balanced. But but that's a good point. You know, and maybe just as a writer, your, you know, your own your own relationship with these characters has something to do with it, right? You might identify a little bit more with one person, just slightly, you know? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, any, anyone else? Amy, did you have any, anything you want to ask? No, I, I'm looking forward to reading the book. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, is any, any questions from Zoom? We have a question on Zoom that okay, says... Great in the chat that says, can you talk more about your writing process? Did you research first or outline and research to fill in your novel idea? And how did you juggle creative writing with your career and family? Okay, two, two questions. Okay, yeah. so yeah. So um, in terms of juggling creative writing with uh, being a journalist and family, um, I would say that once my son was born, 
a lot of my time was devoted and dedicated to him. And that's probably why I didn't take time to go to India and, you know, really do some concerted, what I call reporting, but I can say it's research. Because there a lot of those artists, for instance, who were part of the progressive artist group were alive. Now they've all passed away, but they were alive in the 90s, early 2000s and so forth. So I could have actually met them. Um, so I put my family first, I would say, without even realizing that I was doing it. Because I never thought I was a person who was always putting my family first, but in some way I did. And um, so, you know, that's how I, I did that. In terms of the process of, you know, outlining and researching and so forth, I did outline a lot. I'm an outlining type of person. And so I outlined, I did some research, but you can't, it's not really one or the other. They both kind of go together. So as you write, you realize what things you need to find out about. You may, you know, start with doing some actual uh, research, like, you know, I met the painter, but I don't think I met the painter, uh, Moan Samanth, before I started writing. I think I started writing a little bit. Then when I found him, you know, I met him and that informed a lot of, so kind of, it, it, you know, the, the, the research and outlining, the writing, more research, especially over such a long period of time, it happens kind of in tandem and there's not one first and then the other, because a lot of times a writer themselves doesn't know what all information they need until they write about things. Great, yeah. Um, and any others, do we have any other Zoom questions? We have one more that, that says, um, hi, Pearl, congratulations on the book and the prize. A question related to Michelle's, what was your writing schedule? Um, which I think you've sort of answered. Okay. So um, my writing schedule. Yeah. So her writing schedule, that was the question basically. Yep. Yep. Great. Okay. So my writing schedule, you know, as I say, this is a 25 year long process. There were some years yeah. where I didn't write because so many things were happening in my life. I got married. I moved to Europe. I have since, you know, then I put the book away, like I said, after I had my second draft. And then for this new novel that I've been working on, I got a writing coach whose main job was to help me develop a disciplined practice where I sat down for a certain number of hours a day. I didn't always do that when I was working on this novel. That might have been part of the problem. You know, I'm not a person who just says, I'm going to sit down at the desk and do it at this time and sit here for five hours. I would do it. I would do it very intensely. I might work 10 hours one week, you know, every day. And then the next week I might be very tired and like not work on it. Mm. So my writing mm. discipline was very <laughs> erratic, I would say. And so this coach that I'm working with is a very disciplined person. She had started out as a classical musician. And so she said, for your next book, when, when we are <laughs> done with this, you know, talking about it and all, you're going to have this kind of like, I guess this musicians, you know, sitting down and really mastering the practice, which I think is important. So, yeah, yeah. Making is life can so easily. There's always so, something yeah, demanding our time and attention. So if we don't actively, no one, no one, no one is saying to us, "Oh, you really need to get to your writing." But you know, there's yeah. there's the leaky roof. There's the food that has to be bought. There's the cat meow, whatever you know, whatever it is. So we have to we have to be our own advocates in terms of carving out that time. It's absolutely true. Yeah, it's all part of I think developing a sense of the value and worth of your own work and yourself mm -hmm. as an artist. And probably the fact that it took me so long might be a reflection that I didn't have that sense, you know, because I let myself go this way and that way. And it was a very circuitous route. And one way I did take myself seriously in that I never abandoned the project, but you know, that's what I'm talking about investing in yourself, whether it's money but also your own sense that what I'm doing is worthwhile. When you're writing, it's such a ineffable thing. Who knows if it will come into being? Who knows if it will be published? Right? And you know, the amazing thing about that, I mean, this is a much, much bigger conversation, but um, you know, for for commercial writers, <laughs> there's enormous pressure to produce and 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 a successful best-selling author has to write a book, you know, some of them every year, every two years. And 
Um, and they're very different kinds of books. I, I don't think you can compare that type of book, which has a shelf life of, you know, it's out there for a few months. It gets a big, you know, big, it makes a lot of money. It has a lot of market behind it, sells a lot of copies, and then it's done. It's almost disposable. Whereas something like this, that literally it's a distillation of a large, par par large part of your life. It's, but that distill, that distillation mm -hmm. quality gives it such a, um, it's like a diamond, you know, a diamond is very, very condensed and very sparkly. It's not sort of just, a, you know, mm -hmm. scatter something you scatter over the counter and sweep up and put it in the garbage. So, you know, there's also that and there's no guarantee that this would have. It, I am so thrilled that it's gotten the recognition it has, but that might not have happened and it wouldn't actually have made it any worse, of, you know, any less of a valuable book. You know, so I think as an artist, um, we have an, uh, someone in the audience who's who's not to put you on the spot, but who's also a poet. And as a poet, you must experience some of that. I just wonder if you want to share anything about that. Well, actually, I was thinking of what you were just talking about, the, the idea of distillation. Um, I'm just so fascinated about this editing process, <laughs> what you sort of described as this intense three or four months of editing that you were really kind of not forced but like up against the wall to produce yeah i was actually well, let me just reframe that for people in case they didn't hear that so that was sort of a question about um this distillation process in having to you know after many years of working on the book and 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 in different forms suddenly you're under the gun you have three or four months and you have to you know, really put, you know, pedal to the metal yeah. and get it done. And, and, and what was, what was that like? Is that sort of yeah, the question? And, and I mean, it's, it's so fascinating to me how you spent decades really living mm -hmm. your life and alongside almost like living your life and writing this book, not intensely so much, mm -hmm. but doing research here and there, but it was always there. It was always there. Yeah. And with this new thing, it's almost like, you know, a new blood was, a new thing has happened with this contest when, and then you were, um, you know, you had this new mission to finish the book and really bring it, bring the larger, um, like a 900 or 600? 600, yeah, 900 to 600 um, to 350. Yeah, and it's almost like a master class in editing. You know? Yeah. So you could write a whole, you know, I don't know, like a treatise on, how this thing happened and it's fascinating so I'm, I'm just wondering and 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 i'm just kind of harking back to what you said about how you really have to value your your own power as a writer your own um you know really value your project yeah. in order to give it the life that it deserves so i feel like those two things kind of go hand in hand almost the, yeah how did that distillation process yeah and i and think you know like... publishing is a very important part of it in other words tanya you were saying the the book would would still be good but actually it would have been a different book because mm -hmm. it would have been that 600 page book which would not this is a much better book yeah right yeah. and so publishing is really what i think gives you your worth as a Writer, I mean, we can all value ourselves as writers, you know, and I did. I mean, I was publishing stuff, but there's it's a different feeling when somehow you get that validation from the outside world that they want to publish your book. And um, so that intense period of work, maybe I had more confidence then because I knew it was being published. Mm -hmm. I also had a lot more experience. So a lot of it was rewritten. And I think because of all those years I spent as an apprentice, you know, I had a lot of experience in terms of that I could do it more quickly and I could make all these decisions and that kind of, because writing is a, like you're making a million decisions, right? Do I keep the sentence not, et cetera. And um, so I think publishing is an important part of, of developing course, of that course. worth in your yeah. writing, but you have to still nonetheless believe in yourself and have some sense of the value, right? Otherwise you would just give up. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. That's yeah. actually a great way to end. And um, we're going to say goodbye to our Zoom people. And, and then we, the rest of us are going to so goodbye Zoom people. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you for being here. Yes. <laughs> thank you for all. Thank you all.